Hi, this is James Rubaniak, the voice of Dr. Venture, and you're watching Chronicles of the Nerds. Have a scientastic day. I was actually in the zoo one time and uh, talking to my son. We were in front of the gorillas, and a guy came up to me and said, Excuse me, are, are you James Rubaniak? And I said, uh, yes. He said, oh, I'm a big fan of the Venture Brothers. And I thought, oh, my God, I sound like Dr. Venture. And there were gorillas nearby. So it was actually like a scene from the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like it's like the guy had stumbled upon a real-life Venture Brothers moment. Well, why don't, why don't we uh, talk about Venture Brothers? I mean, that's pretty much the biggest thing uh, as far as nerds go since, you know. Sure. I don't know, the computer was invented. <laughs> what, what, yes. uh, what, what's this been like for you working on this amazing show? It's uh, really pretty great, you know? I mean, it's just one of those nice things that just fell into my lap, which uh, doesn't happen very often in show business. But uh, I, Jackson was basically a friend of a friend, and he just offered me a part on the pilot. He kind of knew me vaguely, uh, but uh, he just offered me this part, and I said, that'll be fun. And we made the pilot, and then uh, lo and behold, uh, it became a, sh a show, which is hard enough to do. And now it's, uh, you know, got a very intense, uh, I guess you'd say, cult following. I went in, and uh, I thought, well, he's Dr. Venture. He's, and I started doing this kind of old scientist guy. It was actually a little Billy West influence. You know how he does those kind of, he has a slightly rubbery quality, to like the old sinus guy in Futurama and stuff like that. So I started doing this kind of thing like this. And I remember Jackson saying, hey, yeah, you can lose some of that kind of quality. I said, okay. And then I did a little more. And he's like, yeah, you can lose that character -y thing. And finally, <laughs> I was just kind of talking like myself. He went, that's it. And so it's basically just a heightened version of my own voice. That's, it's, it's just kind of my voice, but put through kind of the stressed out ringer. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people think I sound just like him, but uh, I think I have a mellower quality than Dr. Bench. Uh, so do you want to give us a breakdown of how long it takes to film an average episode when it comes to your ADR work in there? My a voiceover session for an episode will be... Uh, it'll be like uh, no more than a two hours. It'll be between one and two hours. Sometimes it's really quick. Uh, sometimes it takes a bit longer. You just go in the booth. I get it in advance. I usually don't read it till the day before the session. I read it, sometimes I read it the morning of the session. Then I, so there's really no preparation there. Then I just go in, having read it once, and then you just read your lines. It's all done incrementally. You know, you don't read opposite the other actors or anything. Yeah. Um, all the lines are recorded separately and they're edited together. Uh, Jackson usually, you know, will feed me the other characters' lines from the recording, you know, in the studio. Uh, and then we'll usually do a couple takes where he reads the other lines for me. Uh, and then we usually do a couple where I just read them all straight because you have a sense of the rhythm and the energy of it. And you don't really need to have the other lines read to you at that point. And he does, a, he, he's pretty hands-on with directing. You know, he has very specific ideas about the sort of emotional tone or energy or, you know, quality that he wants. And he'll uh, work with you to get that. And then uh, that usually takes, you know, it's just about 90 minutes or so to do a half hour. And then uh, that's it. And then uh, the turnaround can be close to a year. I think the premiere... This year, I looked it up, had been recorded like 11 months earlier. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's a long turnaround. But we were, I think we have one, are we, am I done? I can't, yeah, see, yeah, <laughs> I can't even just, remember just if start. I have one more episode to record for the, uh, for the latter half of, of season four. Because as you know, the season was split this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're almost done recording that. I think I just have a little more to record, and then we'll be finished with that. Can you give us any spoilers of anything to come? Yeah, in fact, I do know that there's going to be a grand finale. They're still finishing that script, I believe. Uh, oh, I can't give you spoilers. <laughs> I can't give you spoilers. I will say this. A character, I won't tell you who, 
But a character of mine does do a little singing in season two in an episode, and I was very excited about that. He, he, one of the characters writes a little song. <laughs> would, it, would it be a phantom limb about his, about his toaster? Uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I can say, but there is a little... A character kind of gets a, a, little, uh, a little musical in, 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 an, in an episode next season. How, how different is it um, working with, with uh, like between like Doc Hammer or, or Jackson Public? Jackson does most of the directing. And Doc, um, you know, I moved to L.A. a couple of years ago. So now usually what I do is I record in a studio in L.A. And Jackson is on the phone from New York <laughs> directing me. Uh, when I, but I was in New York this year for about two months. Uh, I did a bunch of venture sessions while I was there. Um, and um, usually Doc is, is, is in the studio in New York, but on the phone records, uh, he's usually not on the phone. So it's mostly Jackson directing. Uh, but uh, when Doc is chiming in, it's similar. He just has, they both have very specific ideas about what they want. I mean, they're very collaborative and it's wonderful. And, you know, they're not giving you line readings, but they're, they do have a definite idea about the tone and quality of, you know, scenes and given lines. He's more, uh, he throws things in occasionally and Jackson kind of runs it in terms of directing the performance with me. Have you ever found yourself in the situation where uh, you're doing your lines and you're having a hard time getting it? The second part of this, would you happen to have a favorite quote of Dr. Venture, and could you give that to us? Yes. That happened once, and it was insane. And it was the, uh, the public service announcement at the end of Are You There, God, It's Me, Dean, about uh, testicular the torsion. The <laughs> when I'm saying, like, if you suffer from, I don't even remember what I said, but, you know, your genitals may be dying, you know. <laughs> and the whole thing is like they were, we were supposed to be speaking in this kind of wooden, bad performing style, you know. Yeah. Testicular torsion. And I just found that so effing hilarious <laughs> that I swear to God, it was like 30 seconds of lines, even less. And I swear it took me like 10 times that to fit, <laughs> amount of time. To fit. I just kept cracking up. I could not stop laughing. Every time I would start doing that thing and... Speaking like that uh, and saying those words in that tone of voice, I just kept cracking up. I, I totally lost it. And uh, it was funny. Uh, uh, Lisa Hammer was actually videotaping the session that day. So there may actually be a document of that <laughs> somewhere. Usually, you know, you'll record something and then when it's done, you'll laugh because it's funny and it's kind of a release of energy. But that was one time I could barely get through it and somehow they pieced it together. And I swear when I listen to it, I can hear where I'm about to laugh. <laughs> like somehow they were able to piece together a suitable take between my cracking up on that. So, yeah, that one just killed me. Favorite line? Oh, gee. Gee. You might as well ask, what's, who's my favorite child? <laughs> my mind always goes blank about these favorite line things. Um, I, uh, uh, there was something about this year that I, I, I was very fond of. Uh, He's in a Floyd hole! <laughs> that was in the, uh, the Progressive Rock uh, episode where Dean is uh, over ODing on Pink Floyd. One nerd question here is um, you have to marry one, you have to fuck one, you have to kill one. Of course. Brock... The Monarch and Sergeant Hatred. Um, uh, yes. Yes, in that order. Okay, so, so Mary Brock? Yeah. And you, you, you... For you, security, you, obviously. Okay, you, you fuck the Monarch? Because some, yeah, that so, would have to be intensely nutty. Is it a, is it a alpha male type thing? I think it's more that he's got a lot of, uh, weird energy. And then, so, so you would kill Sergeant Hatred? Yeah, he's kind of annoying, don't you think? <laughs> in that in that cute kind of way. Yeah, yeah. Like and you would think that that's what he would want. That would actually make him happy. If he respected the way that you killed him, I think he'd give you the old salute or subtle smile, you know, as he was expiring. The way the World War One pilot gives a little salute to the other pilot who shot him down, you know, that's kind of a tradition. Like, well done, sir. Well played. <laughs> Um, so I guess as far as the show goes, this is now kind of shifting into a more real question. How much uh, leeway do you get as far as kind of improvisational and things like that goes? 
There's hardly any improv. I'm glad it seems like there is, because I guess that speaks to a certain spontaneity and performance and uh, in the writing. But uh, no, I can count on one hand, uh, one hand that was missing a finger, uh, <laughs> the number of times I've actually ad-libbed something that made it on air. It's very, very rare that I ad-lib anything, and I've done it really a handful of times. And uh, it's very, very tightly scripted and very meticulously directed. So it's definitely not improvised. Again, it's really a tribute to their writing, you know, that there's one doesn't feel the need to, to improvise, to make up stuff. Even like the throwaway stuff, they'll do several takes of what seems like just a peripheral aside just to get the right quality. And they actually do go for a certain... It's funny to talk about a cartoon this way, but even a certain realism within the broad characterizations, you know, on the show. But it's all them. And, I mean, I've... They're like, And the only things I've come up with are teeny tiny things, like once uh, Cat Clops said, go with God, and I, had, I made that up. Like, <laughs> that's the level of improv here. It's like, he said something like, God be with you or something. And, and just for fun in the booth, I said, go with God, which I thought was slightly pithier and funnier. And they kept that in. And another time, there's one where uh, the Phantom Lim is talking to Dr. Girlfriend. And he asks her something sort of rhetorically. And she responds with the correct answer. And I added in the booth that pretty little hip which is actually a line from Quiz Show, uh, the movie. Um, and uh, Jackson Public immediately got the reference and, like, doubled over. <laughs> For some reason, I was very proud that I cracked him up that like that. And uh, something about that just really cracked him up, and he kept that in. And that, that's, like, almost all the improv I've ever done. Although, if memory serves, I did coin the name Spider Skull Island. And I think I was the one who actually put those together and said, well, why don't you just call it Spider Skull Island? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it was so stupid. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very proud of that. That's, that's my most uh, prominent uh, a contribution to the show outside of voicing. James, you know, thank you for, for the interview and thank you for the time. My pleasure. 